Now, this happens a lot for me with life insurance. I am so scared of... All right. Hey, Rob, Mr. Rob, though, thank you so much for being on the show here. We're neighbors and we've known each other for a while, but it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? I'm good, Dan. An absolute honor to be on the show. Big fan. Oh, great. Well, yeah. Um, how's everything been? Uh, tell me a little bit about your um, you know, agency and your operation, where you're at. And I'd uh, love to um, get to know you a little bit more during this talk conversation here. So, yeah. Yeah, so I have uh, currently two locations, one in Orange County in your Belinda, where I actually live, and my original location, which we call the LA office, which is in Glendora, which is where my office um, kind of originated. And the goal wasn't always to have two offices. It just sort of worked out that way. And I have really good employees over there who like coming into the office. And so I sort of had to make the business decision to keep both going, even though it stretches me pretty thin sometimes. But um, ultimately, it's working. Uh, currently, I have nine staff and I just hired my 10th. Uh, we have uh, 5,600 policies and just over eight and a half million in premium with farmers. So um, things are going well. And I always start any kind of call or time when I talk to district managers or agents with the same thing. And hopefully I can do that with you, which is I absolutely love being a farmer's agent. I'm living my dream life being a farmer's agent. Um, and it's not always easy being a farmer's agent, but I just can't believe um, the results that can happen with the right mentality and attitude. And then of course, work ethic, which uh, nobody can compare to you, but uh, we all try. <laughs> no, yeah. Thanks for saying that. No, um, I absolutely agree. You know, what a blessed uh, life we live as being as a uh, farmer's agents, but when did you get started? So I have a unique um, entry into farmers is that I was an agency producer. So I only focused on commercial insurance and uh, I did that for about five or six years. And the agent that I had worked for um, sort of was at the end of his career and also was really negative against farmers. And I had sort of a decision to make whether I was going to start my own or buy his. And because I had so much business with farmers already, mm -hmm. I thought it'd be best to buy the agency. Hmm. Uh, however, I paid a multiple of five times. Oh, uh, wow. Not the current, not the Grant Cardone method, uh, but uh, <laughs> I sort of just said whatever he wanted, I was okay with because I was going to bet on myself. So even though I bought the book of business, I really feel like I was a scratch agent because every dollar plus sum of income that the agency generated when I bought it uh, went to the buyout. And my only income was the new business. Mm -hmm. And at that time of purchasing, uh, I knew nothing of personal mm -hmm. lines. I could not tell you the difference of comp and collision. I, I sometimes still don't know that, uh, but <laughs> I had to learn to be a farmer's agent and, and that's kind of where I went on my journey. And so technically I've only been the agent owner of the farmer's agency for four years. However, I ran the agency as the de facto owner for three years prior to that. And then as the agency producer, um, even prior to that. So I've been with farmers altogether about 12 years now. Oh, wow. So, but as the agency owner, four years, huh? Yes. And way too much in the weeds, but essentially everything, the transaction finalized in 2018, even though uh, I think farmers and my district manager and everybody recognized that I had been the owner for a long time. But, um, but yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're at PC already, you know, so I thought for some reason, like, you know, with, with, with how you present yourself and, you know, in the advisory councils, like the input you put in, like, you know, um, that you're, but that makes sense that you, you were running an operation. Uh, and had a lot of experience. So, um, yeah, the, do you think, um, and well, how did the Glendora office uh, start off? Because you're always lived in Orange County, right? Well, yeah, my wife, or, uh, who I love, I can't, I, I'll give her a plug. I love my wife. Um, <laughs> if I wanted to marry her, I'd have to live in Orange County. So I said, okay. And so the agency that I purchased was actually based in uh, Glendale. So slowly but surely each lease, I've been bringing it closer to Orange County. And then ultimately uh, Glendora, I went to college in that city and um, I thought it's a good family, you know, town. And so I thought that would be a good place for an agency, uh, and a middle ground for me driving to LA every day to Glendora is only about 20 minutes. So, or 30 minutes, depending on traffic. So not too bad. Uh, and then when I got my first lease, I had one employee, uh, made paid a minimum wage. And I just sort of said, 
Uh, let's figure out how to be successful farmers agents. And in this talk, I'm probably going to name drop a lot of farmers agents uh, in the same affinity that you have for collecting Air Jordans. I, I collect uh, quotes from farmers agents that are way more successful than myself. And uh, similar to why you do this podcast, I just I have like a thirst and almost an obsession for knowledge to try and figure out how to be the David Sewell of the farmers agency from your, you know, a couple of your calls ago. And what had happened was I qualified for Toppers Club as an agency producer back when you could do that. Mm -hmm. And it was in San Diego. And generally, uh, the agent that I worked for was like, oh, don't go to any of the breakout sessions. It's a waste of time or anything like that. Um, my wife had come and I, our first child with us. And I was like, oh, I don't really want to go. And I, you know, I went, sat in there and it was going kind of slow. I was like, I'm not going to sit here. I'd rather go to Sandy, you know, go do something else. And I left. And then I said like, no, I need, I need to change my mindset here if I'm going to figure this out. And I went and sat back down and I'm so thankful I did because the agent that was speaking is Adrian Cisneros. I'm sure you know him mm -hmm. um, and anybody in farmers knows him. And it was the first time that I had heard somebody speak so proudly of farmers with such a different mindset and being such an open book. And so I was just mesmerized by that, I guess, energy that I reached out to him and like farmers agents do, uh, he agreed to meet with me and we went to Cheesecake Factory and uh, this was six years ago. And I just said, I would like to get to your level. Can you assist me? And he shared his knowledge and I was forever thankful for that. And what I did was I took his systems and I tried my best to implement them. We still do. But the form that he gave, which was one out of date farmers logo ago, we still <laughs> use um, in our office. And so uh, thankfully, I had the opportunity to speak at the uh, California Agents Conference a couple of years ago. And on stage, I thanked Adrian just because I felt like that was a catalyst to my mindset shifting and realizing what an amazing opportunity that we have here as farmers agents. Uh, I always say to anybody, this job is so much easier than any math class I ever took or any college <laughs> class I ever took. Uh, but where it's hard is the grind, the mentality part. And that maybe you can speak on a little bit because I know you embrace it. It's hard to teach that. Um, and it's hard to kind of cultivate that, but it's what we try and do with our employees. And so um, ultimately that's kind of what led to our progression. And I will say um, I had a goal where I just sort of said, I'm going to sell one policy a day when I was became an agency owner. And I said, how do we sell one policy a day? We have eight hours we can figure this out. And it really did become a math equation, which is, well, we need to quote. How do we get quotes? Now, this is going to counter you uh, and your mindset or your philosophy, but it'll come full circle, is I didn't have any money for marketing. And I said, well, you know what? Let's figure out how past farmers agents had been successful. And it was all through networking, all through mm -hmm. centers of influence. And so I made it a point to go out of my chair, knock on doors, that uncomfortable thing, uh, and go into realtors and mortgage brokers offices and try and be something different than what they currently have. And so I always say this, and you'll agree, I say Farmers is an amazing company and we are the most expensive insurance company in the industry. So let's just <laughs> own it. Uh, but one thing that we also relate to, and it, I'm uniquely qualified to say this because I used to work at the Ritz-Carlton, is we're the Ritz-Carlton of the insurance industry. And the Ritz-Carlton is the most expensive hotel as well, but they don't apologize for it and neither do we, but it's easy for us to say that. But as agents, we have to back that service that the Ritz-Carlton gives and to justify the price. And that's what we've really tried to do in our office. So with mortgage brokers, we realized uh, accuracy, speed, and ultimately um, a, a great experience for the clients uh -huh. was ideal. And so that's what we sort of created these systems. And before we knew it, we started having lenders saying what their pain points were, which was always, I can never get a hold of my agent. I, they're always holding up loans. So that became our pitch. We're an agency, we're never gonna hold up a loan. If you need a price, tell us, and we'll utilize all of farmer's discounts. How badly do your clients want the house? They want it, great. I'm gonna to need to do their auto insurance and their life insurance. Great, 
guess what? We got you into a house. The mortgage broker got paid. The realtor got paid. Escrow got paid. The clients got great coverage. We were a part of the deal. And that's what we did. And so my claim to fame and why it kind of counters where you're, you were at initially was I used to say I spend zero dollars on marketing. I'm going to do this grassroots. And we were writing a policy a day. And then it became to two policies a day. But then, as you know, mortgage brokers sometimes disappear. Sometimes uh, you have to be the squeaky wheel to get their attention. And we, even though that still is our primary focus of leads and generation, hearing you interview David a few weeks ago, I went for a run. I put on my podcast of Dan and David, uh, which people think I'm nuts for, but I, I love it. And I realized, oh, I'm being ignorant. Like I got to, I have to adapt. If David has qualified for 30 PCs or on his 30th and Dan is crushing it and everybody's talking about this marketing, I need to do that too. And I really need to embrace it. And I'm not just saying using quote wizard, but really trying to create like marketing. And that's kind of this next step that we're doing. Wow. So many good things you touched on, Rob. Yeah. I mean, let's just start off first with, um, you know, giving credit to Adrian, you know, I really mm -hmm. acknowledge you for doing that. And I heard I wasn't there at that, um, pre uh, the agents conference, but I still heard how great your speech was. Oh, thank you. That, yeah. That, that's nice. And, no, I, that's I, I, light, and I talked about, I mean, I did talk about, um, give agents props, uh, and there was a few other ones too, but it was primarily life insurance, but that's really kind of you to hear. I, I am super passionate about life insurance. So I'll go on a whole other tangent with that, but thank you for saying that. No, we'll get there, but there was a buzz uh, after your talk there. And okay. again, uh, just on social media. Thanks. Um, and then what about for new agents out there, right? Because I get this too, and it's kind of like, depends on maybe my mood or my situation. And I think, you know, it worked out for you where you reached out to Adrian's a new agent and he really helped you out, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes how did you ask him? How did you reach out to him? Because I feel like I get this and sometimes it's just like, I just don't have the bandwidth. And sometimes I'll just be like, okay, well, let me help because, you know, things were maybe presented the right way. What, what are some, when, we, when you reach out to an agent, I think there's a way to do it. How, why do you think it worked out where Adrian took the time to help you out? Well, a couple things. Um, Adrian's a good guy, a good quality guy. He loves farmers. Uh, but he probably, if I remember correctly, Toppers was in July and I didn't meet with him until Christmas. You know, I was on his time schedule and I was completely okay with that. But I also let him know in my initial email uh, that I heard him speak. I'm not going to waste his time. I just want to pick his brain, name the time and place and how much uh, he can afford me. And I'm there. So I drove all the way out to Riverside uh, and I waited in his lobby. And I talked about this at the agency conference a couple of years ago. What I, I gained so much by just sitting in his lobby because the energy there, people were on the phones, they were high-fiving each other, everything. There was like just this energy where at my agency, it was kind of like the library. It was just like, you know, <laughs> boring. And I realized that here comes Adrian and he's the, he's the supplier of all that energy. They were feeding off of him. And I said like, Oh, there's, there's something here. And then in going and talking with him, he said the same thing. He realized, uh, or what he told me is there's no difference between Adrian and I, Adrian just wants it more. Uh, than I currently wanted it. They have better systems. Okay. Uh, but in terms of solving X equation, it's all the same. You and I are doing the exact same thing. He's just doing it a lot more efficiently and has his team doing it a lot more efficiently as do you. And so me reaching out to him or any other agent, I would all strongly recommend that if there's the agents that have a humbleness and an openness to change what their mindset is, uh, then you should reach out because you are so close to having the success you want and you don't realize how close it is because it isn't, it isn't a system. It's just a small mindset shift. It's a little bit of accountability and to realize that we're all on an equal playing field and there's plenty of opportunity for the Kitajima agency and the Dow agency. It's just a matter of who wants it more. And that's essentially it. Wow. That's really well said. Yeah. We have the same pricing. You know, we yeah. have the same products, you know, so the difference maker is our desire. Um, and um, yeah, I think systems too, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, sh share us some of the game changing systems that has changed your career path, would you say? Uh, one or two yeah. of them. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to name drop some agents now. And I, I don't know if they originated it, uh, but 
there was Topper's Club, uh, San Diego or Carlsbad a couple of years ago. And I heard Bart Baker, uh, who is a perennial PC agent, one of the titans of farmers, say that when one of his clients files a claim, somebody in his staff will always call and email and reach out. That's basic, right? Mm -hmm. I am shocked at how many farmers agents don't do that. So if we're referring this back to the Mm -hmm. Ritz-Carlton, you can't just be given a 1-800 number out. That doesn't give the customer experience. But if we are calling and we're saying, hey, Dan, got to claim in over the weekend. It looks like a windshield. Is everything okay? I know that can be scary. Yeah, it was great. Uh, Thanks for, thank you for calling. That leaves that warm impression where you say, hey, I love Rob as an agent because he's not just collecting my premium every month. He's actually following up and caring. But then now let me name drop another agent. And I've never told her this, but I heard her on like a recording. Uh, Sandra Cavotos in Chicago said the difference between a good agent and a great agent is one more question. So what if I say, hey, Dan, I saw that that windshield claim came in. Hope you're OK. Yeah, it is OK. And say, hey, great. Hey, while I have you on the phone, um, I want to make sure we have all your policies. Do we have your life insurance in order? Well, that one more question, you'd be like, well, no, I, we don't, you don't have my life insurance. Oh, good. Well, listen, I'm going to call you on Monday. We're going to take care of this. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm glad you're okay. And we set that change where that one more question or always be selling, it doesn't necessarily have to be disingenuous, but that intention has to be there. That motor has to be there. And I don't think a lot of agents have that gear turned on out of fear of, coming off as a used car salesman, um, maybe coming off wrong time. doesn't mean you do it every time, but you can always have that conversation of one more policy, you know, or one more question. And that's kind of the wisdom that I seek from other farmers agents and why I like your station so much. Yeah. No, I love all this name dropping too, because now I have some people to reach out to. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if they want it. They're probably like wrong person. (laughs) I never said it, but whatever. Yeah, no, I read Bart's uh, book too. I, I read it too. Mm-hmm. I, I loved it. I, and actually I just, at President's Council, I told him I brought it with me on the plane to read it again. So mm-hmm. I loved it. You no, know, it was a great book. Uh, so yeah, no, I think I see a pattern here. of, uh, And this is something that I totally agree with is to seek out information from other people that are doing well. Yeah, I guess what's hard though, and you have the confidence is I see you on the leaderboard. I see how many policies you write. If I say, hey, Dan, how do you write so many policies? You, how do you answer that question? You know, it's, it's a hard one. Well, <laughs> marketing, well, what, you have what, 15 years of experience doing this. It wasn't always like that. Um, but what would, your, what would your answer be to that, to an agent that says, how do you write so many policies? Yeah, it, 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 I was probably start off with, well, how much time you have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's not. Or how much money do you have? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Because there's so many variables and so many things that, you know, have to uh, work out. You know, their staffing is a big part of it. Marketing is a big part of it. Uh, but it's not a simple answer, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I, I think it is a great question to ask. And the way you ask is so important because, you know, I, I will, I will want to, I will have to spend some time to try to like help you out with your, with your situation, but and to, to share my story and what's working for me too. So, um, but yeah, I think for me, it's just marketing and staffing it with a very, very short answer. Um, but what I want to learn from you, Rob is I came from AAA and they were in the preferred market. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I started writing farmers, we just weren't competitive as far as pricing, not just with them, because I kind of knew what pricing should be in that market. Mm -hmm. And with farmers, it was like, wow, okay. It's, it's kind of tough. And there's other, you know, competitors too, with where we live, like Mercury and, you know, other companies that do well in that market. I see you doing so well in that market in the affluent, you know, maybe it's the risk Carlton. You probably already answered a little bit, but what are some tips on how to, you know, service target and close that type of business because I would love to, the retention, the premium, everything is so much uh, better. So help us out with understanding what your strategy is because I feel like that's your niche. Well, thank you for saying that. And with you in in saying that, I have to name drop another farmer's agent because uh, Nick and Kelly Weiser are PC agents. They're out in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. 
and they're insuring multi-million dollar homes. And I keep picking their brain saying, how do you tap into that market? And it's essentially the same. Like you said, you're a farmer's agent. I'm a farmer's agent. We log into dashboard. We have the same exact quoting process. Now you can either quote a home in wherever. I don't want to be disrespectful to any town, but a small, uh, low income town with a small thousand square foot house, or you can insure a 10,000. Well, we can't do that because farmers won't do it up to $3 million, <laughs> you know, in a more affluent area. Well, truthfully, if we're going to take ownership of what the brand is of farmers, uh, farmers has to be the value bought brand and they have to know that you are going to look out for them. And that comes through education. So for our office, what we sort of had to realize is create systems to help my staff and for us to target the right clients, which is, uh, we never write minimum coverage. We never match coverage because, you know, if I, if you're coming with me at AAA and I would then say I have AAA, I would say stop doing business with a travel agency um, and say <laughs> no, this is what we're doing. Uh, most AAA policies are at one hundred thousand. That's what we know. One hundred thousand. And if they're older, their deductibles are two hundred and fifty dollars. So we are going to say to them, based on this document that Adrian you know shared with me initially, but now everybody has the assets. We're really trying to educate them and we're mm. really trying to say, OK, it's great that you have these limits, but the average accident in California is 400 grand plus the travel agencies covering you for a hundred, which is why you don't want to do business with them. You're on the hook personally for 300,000. Now this happens a lot um, for me with life insurance and I can't explain it. And I know it's a wiring issue of me. I am so scared of the call coming and us under insuring something and it being my fault. Like I, I'm, I'm dreading that day where it's, uh, yeah, I placed that business and maybe it was, I was just trying to close a piece of business and I didn't do my job. And now they're in financial peril. I, I'm scared to like answer that mm. to that. I don't know. And that, especially with life insurance. And I, we will talk about that, but, um, that sort of responsibility that I carry, um, really has guided us to own farmers pricing own, uh, the, the people we're working with and why we're looking out for them and why uh, the more you have, the more you have to lose. And unfortunately in this world, uh, the more you have puts a target on your back. I mean, I would love to get hit by the kid in Dan Kitajima. That's a jackpot for me. You know, I, uh, my attorney's like, yes, good. You know, that's how it is. And the difference between me being the Kitajima Dow insurance, and I'm now a partner in it because I sued you or you having the proper insurance uh, and everything in your family that you've worked for is protected is what our job is. And I think, um, a lot of agents have gotten away to that. And, you know, because in the idea of Facebook presence and Instagram, I still think that there's this huge opportunity for the boutique agency to do really well by their clients. And as a result, uh, people spend more money and the clients that have the bigger house also own the business and the residential properties. And we kind of do it that way. So while I, I always want to beat you, Dan, that's the truth. If I'm not in this to not beat you, um, it's going to just take me a little bit longer to get, find all the rich people to match the policies that you're doing. Not that the policies you're writing aren't for wealthy people, but um, we're just trying to increase the dial a little bit. And going back to the question that we said, if a new agent said, how do you do this? Well, you, I see you post about this, and this is true for me, which is why we seek out wisdom from other agents. We're just trying to increase that dial, just get slightly better every day. And I feel so blessed, truly, that since I became an agent owner, and even prior to that, when I was running the agency, uh, we've never had a folio less than the year prior folio. And we have grown our book of business almost 400%. And so while I felt like a scratch agency and we only looked at that new business column, uh, that one policy a day, that reaching out to the type of clients that farmers really does well with um, has made all the difference in us having success and not spinning our wheels and getting super frustrated and saying farmers is too expensive. We can't compete with AAA. We, we can't. I'm sorry. Uh, but there's a lot of clients that you write and that we write that we do really well with. It's just a matter of targeting them and being intentional with our marketing and how we're doing that. Yeah. Wow. No. Yeah. And that market is so great because yeah, they have more to lose. So they value and then they want to be educated about how to protect themselves too. Um, so that's the really way. And I love how you just own it, you know, own the fact that we're the risk, you know, but you 
Do you, do you, do you literally say we're the Ritz Carlton? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Because people, I, I mean, we just had a really wealthy guy uh, in Santa Barbara sell his company for twenty five million dollars. Uh, he wanted us to insure his home because his company was non renewing him. We did, and I said, "But I can't insure your home until I insure your autos. You have to have an umbrella." And he said, "How's your auto rates?" And I said, "Expensive." And he's like, thought I was kidding. And <laughs> I was like, they are. I was like, but we're going to take care of you no matter what. And he's like, oh, okay. Whereas I wonder how many agents uh, would have said like, well, you know, they, you know, and get really nervous yeah. and stunted. But I think that confidence to a guy that just sold his company for $25 million, what do you care about rates? Uh, listen, you have my cell phone, you're texting me, we're handling this on a Saturday. It is what it is. And so um, while it's not arrogance and it's not, uh, I'm, I try and be a good steward with people's money and we're not trying to just increase insurance rates. At the end of the day though, we wanna make sure that him and his family and anybody's family is covered properly or their business is covered properly. Yep. And the, I think the confidence comes from you knowing what type of service you're going to provide too. Yeah. So I guess the question I have for you on that is, is you have confidence um, that even if you shared your most killer secret, which isn't a killer secret, you spend money on marketing and you're really good at it. Um, who can compete with you? You, you can share it with somebody, uh, but who's going to do as good of a job at marketing that you've been spending the last 10 years perfecting? I don't think anybody. That's why we're all constantly looking. How does Dan Kitajima do this? Is uh, you're like you're years ahead of us on this, and I'm just new to the game. And I'll talk to you about how I adopted that because of your conversation with you and David. Oh, cool. Yeah, no. Um, thank you, <laughs> Rob. Yeah. What was was that was that uh, a question? Well, I don't know what it was, but <laughs> <laughs> so so what I, what I wanted to say is is hearing David and you discuss like marketing and him wanting to adopt, you know, what some of the other younger agents are doing. It got me thinking I was too short-sighted or maybe too ignorant or, or stubborn in my own mind. Whereas my marketing budget was zero, uh, which is okay. More money for the agency, more money for staff, but eventually you plateau. Eventually you get to a policy count where you're losing the same amount as you're writing. And that's the death of the agency. And that's not what I want. You know, we want to constantly be growing. I would love to, you know, be at David Sewell's, you know, what greater goal would it be to be at that agency size? Right. And so I had to say like, Hey, listen, if all these agents are doing this, I need to change my mindset. And so over the past year, we've been working with a company called Lead Force 360. This, I have no ownership in it. Uh, they're trying to get cost share. A lot of agents use them. Mm -hmm. And I called them after our uh, after I, my run, uh, <laughs> listening to you guys. It was an hour and 20 minute run, thanks to you guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, but my calories were burned. But um, I called them and I said, I need to be better. Can you help me be better? And I said, I need to market to everybody. I just don't know. Help me. Uh, know what I don't know. And they gave me a phrase and it stuck with me, which is you need to automate the grind. The grind being me going into the mortgage broker's office. They said like the world is at your fingertips online. We need to do this. And so I said, great. Like I trust you. You tell me uh, I am not going to push back on anything. And so they created this marketing campaign for me. And I am not kidding. Last week, uh, the email started going out, uh, marketing was done and somebody sends me a message in reply saying, call my cell phone. I call his cell phone. Turns out the guy has 99 homes that he needs insurance on today. That's today what we we're just being, talking about uh, before the call, uh, right? Right. Oh, that, wow. Um, and, and that's a hundred thousand in premium. So I'm sure you get this uh, a lot in, in personal lines premium. Um, still nowhere near Dan, but getting closer, watch out. And so, uh, and that would have never happened had I not invested in this great company who um, I've known for a, a long time on commercial stuff as well. Uh, but that, I think a lot of people get scared and I've heard you talk about it, which is investing in yourself. What does that mean? Well, instead of, you know, you get a bonus instead of that, maybe going towards your salary. What if you just took a percentage of that and said this month, I'm going to do it, not expect a lightning in the bottle. Like I got, that was pure luck. As you know, it takes, mm. are you disagree? Well, getting that lead maybe, but you know, you're the one who has to convert that to a, 
you know. Well, that thank you. That's that, kind of okay. <laughs> that tells a lot of expertise and skill to close a, a deal that big. But you know, it, it becomes a numbers game, right? How much do you need to spend get you this amount, and this is the quality of leads, and it's so simple. I mean, we're, what we're talking about is marketing one hundred and one. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't take marketing in college, but uh, I should have, and I could have learned this a long time ago, but you know, you might have to hear things so many times before it finally clicks at whatever part of your life you're in, especially as an agency owner. And at that part, I'm all in, you know, I'm like, great, this is what it's going to take. Because what I also didn't tell you was uh, we had four other people that responded and two other people that responded today because of this outreach. And so there's, results. Now, am I going to get that next month? I don't know. You know, you could probably, I've heard you talk about good leads and bad leads. And, um, but I think there's got to be that desire to evolve as an agency owner. And it sounds silly that in 2022, uh, we have to talk about technology, but I'm old school. I want to meet somebody. I want to see them. I want to do that. And I had to get out of my own head to say, if my goal is truly to be the number one farmer's agent in the country, which it is, I know I have a long ways to go. Uh, but if that's the standard that I'm holding myself to, I can't compete with you. I can't compete with the agent of the year uh, or any of these other agents that I can name drop until I continue to grow and get better, you know, as a business owner. And that's what I'm trying to do, uh, you know, every day. Um, and I fail a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm so happy to hear that. But, you know, I don't want to take credit, but the, the talk led you to the sale, you know, so it's a huge plug for my, uh, my show there. So I appreciate yeah, plug that. It. Yeah, <laughs> ringing but, uh, endorsement from the Dow agency. Uh, no, I, I really appreciate it. But I think one of the things, you know, is that um, the willingness to fail, you know, and to lose a little money here and there. I think that's that's something that I see in a lot of agents. And maybe sometimes it's an ego thing too, because maybe you'll suck at something for a while when you're spent so good at something that, you know, has worked for you for over the years. So, you know, letting go of your ego and say, hey, I'm going to suck at this, but I'm going to try. I'm probably going to lose money and uh, trying it. That's kind of how what I've done, you know, and having no shame and losing and um, had so many marketing right. campaigns and so many right. things that didn't work. But I think one of the things that I probably could look up to you in your situation was tell me about the experience of going from the producer and paying that money or going into debt. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. You know that. Uh, so, so I think a lot of marketing and trying new things takes a lot of courage, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what got me thinking like, man, I'll put you back in, in your shoes when you're a producer and just having that job of just closing commercial deals to now become an agency owner and taking that type of responsibility and financial commitment. What got you to, what, what was it in you that made you make that jump? Well, truly, I've never been short of confidence. Uh, I've always thought that uh, I often would laugh. I have like little minions in my head that are jumping up, screaming, I'm the best, I'm the best. <laughs> no way would I have ever landed my wife had I not thought that in my head. But of course she would want to be with me. I'll go up and talk to her. And then when she was confused while I was talking to her, that was confusing to me. But, um, but what you're saying is a little bit of, um, it took a grind because where I was at that point, I knew I could bet on myself. Um, a lot of it comes from playing sports, you know, it's mm -hmm. throw me in there or working out. You know, if you've felt those low points and you've been able to grind out of it, you have a little bit more confidence. Uh, but I had a motor and I had this burning desire to provide the life that I thought I wanted. And I saw Agents do it, such as yourself, such as Adrian, um, and so and, and there's there's countless more. I can list them all. Um, uh, I saw them do that. That I said, like, all right, well, then it's just a matter of work ethic and it's grind. And then, but more than that, it's extreme uh, accountability. And it goes back to like Jocko, where he says that that discipline equals freedom. So I would I was a machine. I would wake up at five. I would hit the gym every single morning and then I would get into work and I would grind. And then on the weekends, I would grind and I still do on vacations, still work because I have held myself to that one policy a day goal. And I think that makes a big difference. But also we have a saying and I stole it from Boiler Room, which is a sale is made on every call. 
Either we sell them some insurance or they sell us why not. Either way, mm-hmm. a sales a sales going to be made. Uh, it's just a matter of who's going to close. So if I'm if I'm going to you, Dan, and I'm saying here's all this insurance, and you're telling me, nah, it's not a good time, too expensive. I failed as a salesperson. So what I would then do is say, where did I go wrong in this, and try and really take ownership. It's not farmer's fault. I've used you in so many talks, Dan, because. I talked to so many agents in California that say farmers is too expensive. They're pricing us out of the market. I say that. And then I think, well, Dan's selling about 500 policies a month. Uh, so somebody's buying insurance. So we're in the same market. What, what's the difference? Mindset, attitude, business acumen. So maybe, yes, we would all like farmers to be less expensive, but that doesn't matter. We'd like it to be easier. Sure. Uh, but we just roll with how it is. And that's kind of been inspiring to me. And I think to a lot of agents see your success as, oh, no way, or there's a shortcut going. There's not a shortcut. We just are constantly working on it to refine and be better. I love that you brought that point. I don't think no one's ever brought that point in my shows, but yeah, accountability. You know, sometimes when you say, oh, it's farmer's rate, right, then you're actually giving control away from yourself. Yeah, when you a- say like, okay, well, what did I do wrong? Why did they sell me on not buying it? Then yeah. you actually think of ways like, oh, maybe I should have said this this way, or maybe I, sh- I didn't sell, say that, or maybe the timing wasn't right. And you actually grow from taking accountability and you take the control back. So I think that was a great word there, Rob, when it comes to difficult markets or whatever situation we find ourselves in mm-hmm. to always make it our fault. And mm-hmm. that's really where we actually see the results because it, yeah, it sucks in the beginning to say, Hey, it's my fault. And it's so much easier to put the blame on something else like the company. Um, but it's really, even if it is, it's still not, it doesn't help you. Except it just protects your ego back to the ego thing. I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to articulate it is um, trying to be objective. Cause we all have feelings. We all have emotions. We've all been, uh, felt slighted or not seen by, you know, the company or whatever it is. Uh, but ultimately, if you put yourself in a position, I think to, to continue to get better, I, I think good things will come if you do it for the right reasons. And mm-hmm. so um, that that's kind of everything. I feel like I'm going through all sorts of tangents, but that <laughs> your original question was from a producer to an agent was ultimately saying, I am now at a point in my life where I feel like I'm willing, like bet on me and Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that I do. So a huge, huge uh, source of pride for me is I've now brought in eight people into farmer's insurance through the protege program, uh, through agent, direct agent referrals, uh, three of those, and then to a corporate employee as well. So I practice what I preach. I love farmer's insurance. Um, And I tell everybody I love to do that. However, of those eight people that have succeeded, uh, we've had a lot of people that haven't because they just get in their own way. And I have a hard time. I know you sit with your office on, you know, meetings and working on yourself and control, but it's really hard to get like what I call a grown up to change their mindset. Uh, You know, it's hard. They, They look at us like we're, we're different or we're not getting it, or they look at themselves like they don't get it. But truly, I mean, Dan, we're very similar in mindset, but we're probably very different people, but we have that same goal. And that could be for anybody just as David or any of the other PC agents, we're all different in backgrounds, all different uh, with educational and culture and family and whatever it is. uh, But we're all have the opportunity to crush it if you want to. And that's what I try and tell anybody. And so I, it goes back to what I started with. I'm living my dream life. I cannot believe how fortunate I am. And I'm so scared of it going away that I just continue to put my head down and keep grinding. How old were you when you brought the agency? Uh, I was 30. So I'm 37 now. So I was right. I mean, oh, wow. my, daughter, my daughter was just, I have four kids and my daughter Beautiful was just family. Born. Thank you. And, um, Absolutely. and, you know, it's just, uh, I'm just very fortunate. And I'm, for me, uh, I always said like, Oh, I want to go to the achievement clubs. Cause it's a free vacation with farmers. You know, I'll just take my family. And so, uh, if I work hard, farmers will pay for me to go on vacation with my family. And then they'll also pay us and bonus us. And it just went all around. So that's kind of was part of the motivation. So that's nice as well. Yeah, no. And I think I want to touch on, you know, I think the separator in your situation and for many agents, like you said, on betting on yourself, but the confidence piece, you know, is that you think just a DNA thing or do you, or, and if it is, how do you think you could get other agents to 
build up that confidence because mm-hmm. that will definitely change their careers. Mm, all it takes is one sale and you've done the exact same thing as any other agent has done. It's never going to be that good. Uh, going back from that movie Boiler Room, uh, there's a scene in it where they say, act as if. Act as if you're the CEO of the company. Now, that doesn't mean to be arrogant, but I can tell you, I had a client, um, com- a large life policy I wrote last year. Uh, the, the premium was close to $140,000 in life premium. <laughs> wow. And when I went and presented it, I presented option A and option B. Option C was uh, more expensive. It was, and I said, oh, you know what? I don't think I'm going to get the sale with that. So I kept option C home and I went and I presented option A and I presented option B. And he said like, well, I'd really like something in this price point. Do you not have anything there? And that was option C. I got in the way of my own sale because I put expectations on it myself where I should have said, here's option C. Tell me what you think and kept A and B in the pocket. Well, that was last year. And I'm still learning and still failing. And ultimately I was able to backtrack like, oh yeah, uh, we could definitely do that. But I didn't even bring it into the meeting with me. So I was like, well, let me, uh, I'll email that to you over. And then I start scrambling. Whereas I should have just been able to like role play it before, own it of how much it cost. Ultimately he said, yes, that sale led us to being number two in the entire company last year in life premium. And uh, in addition to other policies, but that, was still a teaching moment for me. So kind of what you said is going into each situation saying, hey, we're selling insurance. It's a commodity they have to have. This is the price. If they say no, it's nothing against me personally, but it just means I need to get better at sales. I'm going to go through all the Dan's YouTubes. I'm going to go through all (laughs) of like, you know, the available information or reach out to a farmer's agent. I'm sure you've gotten those calls where go to the top agent in your district and just say, hey, I failed on this. I bet you would take this call, Dan, as busy as you are. Hey, I failed on this sale. I see you do a lot. Can I take two minutes of your time to see how you would have approached it differently? Yeah, I'll give you two minutes. That's easy enough. And then they might have said, you know what I would have done? I would have gone at this angle. And I would have said like, okay, thank you so much. And that would have been a, you know, a learning and teaching moment. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the mindset that we try and do. Wow. Yeah, no, I think those are great ways to approach it. Like a specific case, you know, how would you close it? You know, those are better probably questions for other agents than, you know, how, what, what do you do? <laughs> you know, like how do you sell yeah. a lot? Because that's just too vague. Uh, but yeah, the congratulations on these sales, man. Well, so then what was also relatable, and maybe you felt like this when you read Bart Baker's book. It was the first time I read an insurance book where I was like, this was written for me. You know, like it was relatable. It was um, it was somebody saying, I wanted to be this, have this level of success in insurance. I achieved it. This is how I did it. Here's how you could do it. And we absorbed it like a sponge. Well, hearing your podcast with David, and there's other good ones that I can reference, but, um, you know, kind of hearing him talk about his life premium, but his issued and paid is off. Well, I'll be honest with you. I went to PC last year thinking, hey, I think I'm going to get nominated for life agent of the year. I finished number two in the entire company. I told my wife, I was like, hey, oh, let's, I need a tux. Like, I'm, <laughs> uh, and, and anybody there, I mean, I know maybe some people don't do it for the awards, but why not? We're trying. We might as well try and be the best. Uh, a trophy me- is meaningless, but it's, hey, we worked hard and here's the achievement. Um, and so then at PC, I wasn't even on, nominated for life agent of the year. And uh, ultimately, it wasn't farmer's fault. Um, You know, I was told your issued and paid wasn't where it needed to be. And it's like, well, we're writing a good amount of policies. I think last year we wrote, you know, eight or 900 new business policies. My premium is fantastic, but we have a system failure on issued and paid. So agents like Mikey Ruiz or Christina Mancelli, who write 100, 200 life policies a year, they're doing it better than me. And I'm failing at that. And it's a system failure. And so what often, and maybe you feel like this, uh, you know, people look and they say, Dan, your numbers are killing it. I'm constantly looking at my agency saying like, we are doing so much stuff wrong. And, you know, it's not, um, not 
appreciation for where we're at. We know that we do a good job for our clients, but we have so much more to improve on and it just takes time. And for me to know that I got really a good life case and we, we consistently write a good amount of life premium every year. Uh, but to know that I'm failing on issued and paid has been haunting me. And so then I reached out to Christina Michelli and I said, how are you doing this? How are you writing these life policies? And she's a PC agent. She said, I'll show you exactly how we're doing it. And she gave me their system and then it's implementation. And now we're trying to implement it and we're failing at it. So I'm failing at it because <laughs> I'm not, the accountability is not there. And you know, it's hard when you're trying to bring on something new. Um, and so it's just constantly trying to tweak uh, where we're at as business owners so that we can continue to level up. And that's the goal, uh, I would say for you and for me and for a majority of the agents we know that we look up to and try to be. Yeah. There's so much, there's so much in this business that we could do better, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I re really resonate with you on that. The funny thing is that the premium is what people would rather have. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's funny you say that because uh, that's the harder part. The, uh, I, somebody Let's said that work. to me, like, oh, you know, you did make money. But for me, this is the truth. And I, I promise it's the truth. And I would say this to you, even if I wasn't on this call, uh, as I said, that I'm so scared of uh, something happening to one of our clients and it, we didn't do right by them in terms of increasing coverage or relieve them an opening. Um, I feel the same way about life insurance. Mm -hmm. I am so afraid of getting that call because it happened one time where the spouse called in that the husband had passed away and she said, did he ever do life insurance with you? And I had to have that internal moment where I was like, did he? No, wait, did, did he return? Did I reach out to him? Was that on me that he didn't do that? And I'm going through my messages and thinking like, oh, I hope I'm not responsible for this. And ultimately he didn't have life insurance. And we did reach out two times and we just never followed up because, you know, the lead kind of just fizzles out. Mm -hmm. I took ownership on that. I failed that family. And I mean that, like I, I felt like I had to get on the phone and say like, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, and then what she has to go to go fund me and the difference maker between me and another family, not having to have a bake sale or go fund me is me asking one more question about life insurance and pursuing that. Well, we're writing way too many policies by not adding life insurance. I feel like it's a failure and I'm so scared about it, but it's like trying to fix that situation. And so uh, when I, whenever I talk to other agents, I say for us, we have, we're licensed in life that I feel like we have a uh, professional and an ethical obligation, ethical obligation to sell life insurance. Uh, but I take it one more step further. I take it moral. Like I feel like I know what you need. It's my job to do everything possible short of ruining a relationship to get you to protect your family because I have seen the negative aspects both in my personal life and in my professional life of what happens when a family doesn't have life insurance. And to know that I was the difference maker or could have been the difference maker on both ends, having given death claims that we've written life insurance and having to say, sorry, no luck, uh, that I don't ever want that feeling again. So as much as we try our best as an agency to do better, that's our goal is always that every single person that we talk to, we are talking about life insurance just because auto accidents. I mean, your car, I'm sorry. I know you love your BMW. I don't care about your BMW. You care about your BMW. <laughs> I don't care about it. Uh, but God forbid something happened to you. You know, that's something that I care about. That's a little bit more real. A dented bumper is silly to me. Um, uh, but you know, a family having to have the mom now go to work or whatever that looks like kids getting pulled out of school and selling homes uh, mm. to me for 20 bucks or 50 bucks a month, that could be the difference maker. And so. Yeah, no, that's really powerful stuff, Rob. You know, um, I think the key word there was obligation um, yeah. and making a moral one where it's tied into your ethics. You know, once you fun. have. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, no, once you have that, that explains why you're so successful at selling life insurance. You know, I think that's the one thing I, I'm going to take away from, well, so many things, but one of the biggest one is that when you, when you put it like that, it's almost like you, me telling myself it's unethical for me to not offer life insurance to every single person. And no one wants to identify themselves as an unethical person. So if you make it like a moral obligation, Mm -hmm. and then it's just, there's no way you're going to not ask that one more question. 
So I, I think that's um, really well said. I think I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to tell my team tomorrow, you know, yeah. uh, is that we have to look at it as an obligation because we are insurance professionals. People hire us to protect their families. And if we're not doing our job, then it, it's, 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 we're, we're not being a good person. <laughs> like mm-hmm. we, I, I want to go there with my team actually. Uh, so that's, that's powerful, man. Well, yeah. And, you know, I always say like, if you don't want, you don't want to take it to the emotional level, it goes back to what we previously talked about, which is extreme ownership, which mm-hmm. is, it is, it is on me. I am licensed to sell life insurance. My eight, my staff is licensed to sell life insurance. If we don't do it because of out of fear or busyness, or we just don't want to, um, that to me is a complete breakdown as an employee, as a training, as a culture, and it's unacceptable. Uh, And so, and you build relationships with your clients too. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you do do that. And so it's important to kind of have that aspect. Now, a lot of people get scared because life insurance can be very like used car sales many, and you want to do that, but um, you, 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 there's so many, so many resources. And so I've name dropped a few. There's none better in the company than Jack Jameson, uh, you know, district manager. Mm-hmm. I've stolen so much from him and I, I should give him credit in this forum because he doesn't know how much I've stolen from him, uh, but he <laughs> openly shares that. But there's, you know, great agents like Christian Slayton and, and Debbie Huber are that I have just absorbed their information and tried to adopt it into our agency. And this is the truth. I say this to anybody, uh, I do not sell life insurance for commission. Like I, I have no idea the percentage commission on life insurance or how it figures out. I can never figure it out. You divide it by 12 and then you add, a, you know, it's not for that. I mean, it turns out you do get paid by life insurance and that's a revenue stream, uh, but it's purely for the fact of checking off a list of, okay, these people did it. And so I have countless stories of us pushing and pushing and pushing and them agreeing and then somebody passing away. And there's such a sense of pride that we get to say, I have good news. In this turmoil, we have something for you, a tax-free check of a, a lump sum of money that is going to make this grieving time a little bit easier for you because you're not gonna have to worry about who takes care of the mortgage or any of that. And so for me, my goal is to try and just get better at it, to sell more policies, uh, not for leaderboards, not for awards. If that happens, it happens. But just because of, uh, I feel slightly embarrassed. I feel slightly embarrassed that we aren't selling more than we are uh, with the premium we're writing and with the amount of new business and homes we're bringing in. So it's something that's been on my mind a lot. And then to hear you and David talking about it a couple of weeks ago, I was like, okay, I'm not the only one. It just feels good. And then, uh, you know, it's constantly evolving. Yeah. No. Yeah. When, when he, when he mentioned all those things that like with all his accomplishments, like what he could be doing better and nitpicking <laughs> at his yeah. Uh, operation. Yeah. I, I really was like, wow, even at his level, like that happens because I do that all the time. So mm-hmm. it was kind of refreshing to see that in talking to you too. You know, and I think that's part of what, you know, makes uh, elite agents elite is they always think they're always very grateful and very, very, like you, you started off with, you know, the opportunity has been so great for your life, but at the same time, there's this unsatisfaction always there, you know, so it's funny how we've seen these patterns when I talk to agents uh, like you. Yeah. And I do, I, I do think we're born with it, but you know, there's a certain aspect of that, maybe competitiveness. Uh, but you know, when I, this, I, I think it could be taught. Like, I think it can be taught. And I think it doesn't matter what age you are. It is something that if that is your goal, you can rewire the way you think, but ultimately it requires um, two things, um, a commitment and accountability. That's really it. And getting inside of our head and fixing all of our shortcomings is truly the hardest part of life anyways, you know? And so understanding why we get angry when we do and, uh, but also, why we have what our job is and how we're able to impact our employees lives and i get a huge sense of pride on some of our employees success stories and goals that they've written not only from a financial standpoint uh but also from like a career standpoint and an achievement standpoint 
it's, I, I just pinch myself saying like, well, this is kind of cool. But with that comes great responsibility. We have to make payroll every time, you know, mm-hmm. we can't, uh, we have, you know, to keep the lights on or whatever that is and continue to provide that. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility and that requires somebody to be really disciplined in a lot of parts of their lives. Yeah, no, there's so much fulfillment in seeing them grow that it almost becomes something that, you know, um, yeah, and again, obligation to make sure you're making the sacrifices and making sure they're being able to have a financial future or agency because, you know, they have a choice to pick who their employer is. Mm-hmm. They pick, they're they picking us. We can't take that job lightly. Um, I'm, I'm talking at the, um, I have like a breakout session at the agent conference uh, in Reno on staff, but uh, I'll on staffing and I'll, I'll talk about that, but I, I'm shocked at how many farmers agents don't realize why nobody's applying to their jobs. You know, if you type in uh, insurance jobs, Orange County, there's probably 10,000 jobs. <laughs> what differentiates any of us? And you really have to know that and really try and cultivate that. And so, um, and I've learned that uh, this is true. I'm not blowing smoke. I, I really have, at least you're intentional with your staff. I really think it does make a difference. What David said, how he touches every employee every day, um, mm-hmm. you know, that makes a difference. And that occurred to me. I was like, wait, I don't think I do that. Maybe by happen chance, I was like, but there is a couple remote employees. I was like, no, mm-hmm. I, that's, I got to do that. And so I think that makes a big difference as well. It um, does. Yeah. yeah, I think that I, way. Yeah. I do have a question for you. Um, and you tell me how much time we have, but um, what would you say you wish you would have known sooner um, at this stage of my career? You know, like four or five years in, you still have epiphanies. What would you say you wish you would have known sooner that might be helpful for me? Oh, wow, Rob. Yeah, that shows a lot of humility to ask. I, ha- I have another question for you, but. Um again how much time we have <laughs> there's so many yeah. i would say the automation piece mm-hmm. you know i was buying the leads and then um i think the automation piece and using technology to communicate in more of a massive mm-hmm. format that we have the ability to do and not taking advantage of that sooner has been a game changer for me because you know we could have so many people if you have 10 employees there making how many phone calls and how many texts and how many yeah. emails but you could literally have one system that will 10x their activity level then we have to leverage that you know yeah. because i mean we've said it for years it's a numbers game mm-hmm. so the number of contacts we make uh makes a difference yeah so i think um but you're already um doing that with you know and you got any results from that so i'm not yeah. sure how much value that will bring you no it's affirmation of i'm on the right track because it's wanting to get to that next level i can never compete with you you know that i can't compete with you from a production standpoint uh if i want to be the number one agent in the company i probably got to be the number one agent in california uh that's you I can't come anywhere close to what you're doing, dialing for dollars. Uh, We're playing two different games. And so there has to be that implementation. Will I be as good as you in, you know, a year? No chance. Uh, But it does tell me that this sort of new direction that I'm hoping to take our agency to while sticking true to our core could really pay dividends if I stick with it. Yeah. And I think if you, add that in into your current market because i really wish i was in your market is 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 so much more of a uh the retention wise and premium wise and i think even the relationship you build with your clients is mm-hmm. more uh fulfilling yeah. you know uh the value of the insurance so there's so, but using that marketing method to your niche i think that could be really really big for you so yeah sticking to your core okay. and your values I think I wouldn't really move from there because you already know how to talk to this group of people and you already know how, what they like to hear and how to um, basically turn them into clients and build relationships with them. Mm -hmm. So with that skill and expertise and mixing it with just trying to find ways to find more of them, you know, I think that's that's really, yeah, 
I appreciate um, that. Um, thank you. Um, because it does, sometimes you kind of, um, you know, you're on this journey by yourself and you're like, is this the right one? And then, you know, a couple of months in, you don't get results and you're like, all right, I'm going back to what I know, you know, but there's all those like memes that you see that like somebody quits and then right behind the next step is where the ultimate success is. And so, um, I always try and remind myself uh, with those kind of illustrations. Yeah. And it's a balance game too, because you don't want to just change, you know, everything too. Like, you know, so you want to stick with what you're doing, but add a right. few more tools to it. Right. Because you, you don't want to be like, okay, well, I'm going to start writing a bunch of non-standard. <laughs> then that's yeah. not going to be, you know, uh, the direction you want to go to. So it's such a balance of being consistent, but also being adaptable, but not yeah. too adaptable. We're changing what has been working for you. Um, but I had a question for you, Rob, because yeah. I think speaking of embarrassing, you know, the, my life insurance numbers. Okay. So would you, um, would you think it's better to have each producer be able to get licensed, you know, and half of them are and offer life insurance to, you know, every one of their contacts after every close and during the sales and everything or do you think it's better to just have one or two that just does that and specializes it and tries to, you know, uh, write our book? Um, for somebody like you, and this is really, uh, I think the big reason why so many of those agents who write a ton of policies have so much success is um, I would have every one of your employees have the ability to sell life insurance because the hardest part with life insurance is getting somebody on the phone. So I stole this from somebody else. Uh, I can't give credit to, cause I don't know who I got it, but um, <laughs> I'm claiming it as mine until somebody <laughs> copyrights me. Uh, but from here on out, consider farmers insurance, a life insurance company that happens to write auto insurance and commercial insurance. So if they said, um, uh, if they called into Kitajima agency and they say, you know, wherever it is, and you say, you know, great, we're glad we can assist you. And they're like, I'm here for the auto insurance quote. Great. And say, that's awesome. Uh, we're also going to be talking about life insurance because you can't have an auto policy without having life insurance. Where is your life insurance policy that you own? That's not through your employer. They're always going to say no and say, okay, good. Uh, well, then we're going to take care of that. And the good news is, is it discounts your auto insurance because we do care about your expense. We want to make sure your coverage is okay, but we also want to make sure your family's okay. So that's why we do things a little bit differently. Uh, my fear is, is if you just transfer it over to somebody, you've prolonged the call or you've gotten them off the phone. And so much of us with life insurance is chasing people. Mm -hmm. And so if you have them on the phone and you're able to close that sale at the point of uh, contact, Farmers has diversified their products that um, allows uh, up to 300,000 in life insurance without a pyramid for the most part. And they're going to increase that. I should say that. Uh, I have no hard feelings with anybody that writes life insurance. And some, there was a little stigma of people that uh, are agents that were writing, you know, small life policies that were guaranteed issued. Uh, for me, if they are able to put a life insurance policy on somebody that doesn't previously have one, I'm okay with that. Like I'll take that any day of the week compared to um, GoFundMe. For us, we seem to be taking a long time because we're really doing a needs analysis. And Dan, you probably need $50 million worth of life insurance. So we're really, really doing that. Um, and that takes longer and it's a longer sale. And we could be doing a lot better at just knowing that which client that might not be a good fit for, but a quick and easy 300,000, 10 year for us to have a conversation later to convert those. Uh, that's what we need to get in. And so those agents that are writing a ton of policies, but the premium is only, you know, 10 or $15 a month, uh, that there, that's what I need to adapt. That's what I need to do. And for you, I would say with the volume you have, you can be, you're going to, you, you know, my luck, I'm going to think I have like finally hit my hundred policies and then Kitajima is going to come in with 700 life policies. Uh, but that's what I, that's what I would do for sure. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Sometimes it is my producer is getting, you know, like, Hey, like, you know, the simple term is just not the, the premium. And then the, 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 the commission isn't that exciting, but I think, well, the obligation piece of it, you know, mm -hmm. hey, we're not doing this to make money. We're doing this to protect our families, which is our job. Uh, but that will lead to better things, you know, retention wise and referrals <laughs> and just so many great things are going to happen from that. So uh, I think that's where my, my I got to get my producers to have a mind shift. But yeah, I was kind of always tweaking with how do I get more life insurance spots? Because I have a couple of people that are doing really well in it. And I have just a couple of people who never ask. So uh, having everybody licensed and everybody asking, 
that's going to be the game plan. And I think yeah. we've, uh, you have to change the culture, which you know is hard. So we openly lose money probably on life insurance, but I just sort of say, Hey, for every time you ask somebody about life insurance, I'm going to give you a $50 bonus. That's what I've resorted to because I, so I said, you can make $500 today by asking people, but I've had to change that mindset so that they get into that habit, uh, because it's a training failure on onboarding on my part, uh, for the employees that I've been bringing on, I've been a lot better, but you know, some mm-hmm. of those employees that have been with you to get them to change is always a little bit more difficult. So as a whole, we have to do this together. And my team is great. They really, anytime I ask them to jump through hoops or whatever it is, they always rise to the occasion, but we still are ultimately falling short. And I'll always feel like that. I think you and David said it like never, you know, always happy and blessed and appreciative and never satisfied. Like that's truly the best way to describe me as a whole. Yeah, no, we have a lot in common, but yeah, just for asking, you know, compensating our team and starting new ones off with the right behavior. Mm-hmm. Man, there's just so many good, great things we talked mm-hmm. about today, Rob. Yeah. I mean, I just want to just really thank you for your time. Yeah. Uh, I think agents are going to get a lot out of this, especially if you're newer and you're struggling to ask. Ask some of your agents, you know, that uh, you look up to. Uh, have the confidence that you do. <laughs> I don't know how you can do it, but you know, th- th- certainly it helps. It comes from experience and every policy is the same thing. You know, sometimes just the premium just changes, but a sale is a sale. Uh, and just, you know, the life insurance piece, that's going to help me personally the most, you know, but I think the overall concept of just taking accountability of where your agency is at and where your business is at by just looking in the mirror, you know, I mean, yeah. there's just so many things that you talked about, Rob, that uh, I just, you just brought so much value to, uh, to my show. So I really want to acknowledge you oh, for your success you. and your humility at the same time. Yes. Uh, and just someone that, you know, I'm proud to know better as, uh, uh, in the farmer's family. So, yeah. um, any last words of advice or oh, really shared a lot of wisdom, but mm-hmm. anything, uh, that we've missed out on, uh, uh, every day, not every day, not taking advantage of this opportunity is a wasted day. Uh, you're one, you're one call away from, uh, a sale and a bigger commission. And the thing that I always say with calls is, is I've yet to find a career that we can get compensated for our effort 30 days later. Uh, and if you want to raise it's waiting for you, the phone's there. We don't have to ask our boss for a raise. We are so blessed in this business to say, I want to make $10,000. Okay. I sell X amount of policies. And on August 1st or September 1st, there's my $10,000. And that opportunity is waiting for all of us in this industry. Uh, And I'm so thankful I get to be a part of it and thankful that you got to have me on your show. Yeah. And wait one more year and you can get that 10,000 again. Yeah, exactly. How great is this business? That's the smart, there's your wisdom. No. And also, um, yeah, I missed out on it. Like you just talked about it, you know, just that one more sell, one sell a day Mm -hmm. and you've grown, you're growing your folder every year. Yeah. You know, keeping it that simple, Rob. So man, I can't thank you enough really, uh, for your time and Mm -hmm. your, uh, strategies and your story. Uh, we're going to be keeping in touch. I think, yeah, if you don't mind, we'll probably have a part two. Uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's and, run and, it back. A sequel. If you're local, then we might have to. Uh, maybe we could do one in person. Yeah, no, that'd be good. And then I can just put a little bug in your office, and I can figure out what's going on, how to sell more policies. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, you probably want to stick to the type of policies you write <laughs> from what we do. But yeah, no. Hey, thanks again, Rob. We'll keep in touch. All right, have thanks, a great one. See you.